Okay, welcome guys. So this is the third uh, part of this, this series of um, videos talking to the team about the gear that we recommend. Uh, we've already gone through recreational kit and specific side mount kit. So today we're going to be talking about technical diving, specifically twin set technical diving. And so for, uh, for this, this video, we've got uh, the, the team members, uh, Dave Pierce, who obviously you've seen for the other ones. We've managed to get Bruce out, who's an avid tech diver from way back. And also um, our, our favorite Tom Crisp, who's been um, a team, global dive team member for many, many years, but he's on sabbatical at the moment, I'd like to think of it. But uh, yeah. so yeah, one, one of the original kind of tech divers from, from the dive shop. So, uh, so yeah, welcome everyone. First off, we'd like to uh, welcome you, Tom. And, and if you, just for the guys, if, if the guys who don't know, you just have a quick rundown of uh, what you've been up to and, and what your background is, that kind of thing, mate. Yeah, so I mean, um, I got into diving at pretty young age, um, nine, I think was my first dive. And then um, as far as technical diving goes, I mean, I, I was working over in the Red Sea um, when I was 18. And as soon as I was old enough, I ended up taking my first technical diving class over there. And that was back in the days of the old Bend and Mend Bowman tables where we were diving, you know, pretty aggressive profiles. So uh, been in it for probably about 12 years now and um, from the Red Sea kind of evolved more into wreck diving and kind of deep reef and then from there started getting into cave diving and um, had a fair bit of uh, activity with GUE back in the top, back in the day and then um, that's kind of progressed more into rebreathers and side mount and that sort of stuff so uh, yeah, kind of fairly long history within um, technical diving. Um, so yeah, hopefully you can bring something to this conversation. Pretty sure you can. Cool. And we'll go across to you, Bruce. Trying to give the guys, um, the guys back home, a bit of a uh, bit of a background. <laughs> What's your name? Where did you come from? Still a black. <laughs> well, originally I'm from the UK, uh, which is where I did all my uh, tech diving training and everything. Um, originally, I started off doing nitrox in '94, and then I did my open circuit. Uh, Trimix, uh, Nitrox in 94, then Trimix, open circuit Nit Trimix in 96, uh, then on to the rebreather in February 99, which I've been then diving ever since. Um, I am tech trained to Tech 100, or 120 as it is on INTD, uh, which I did, mm, must have been 10 years ago now. So yeah, so I've been diving technical for quite some time. Cool. Awesome, thank you. And you've been working for Global Dive for how many years now? Ooh, two and a half. Two and a half years? Cool. So mm -hmm. you're like the yeah. baby of the group. <laughs> yeah. Well, I thought that was Sam, but okay. <laughs> He's not here. He's not a tech guy. <laughs> All right, and Dave, give us about your tech background. Yeah, so I've been diving for about 20 years, but I started getting into tech probably about eight years ago. Um, and yeah, just started with um, TDI, Advanced Nitrox and Deco. And, and I've sort of worked my way up from there to where nowadays I'm um, a dive side mount on open circuit and um, rebreather, um, just working on my, uh, my sort of higher level rebreather certifications at the moment for Trimix and things. So. Awesome. So I think we've, we've been safe to say we've got a reasonably experienced group. There's always more to learn. I think that's the other thing. I think everyone around the, the, the group is reasonably humble and there's some massive experience there. So. Um, so yeah, so we'll we'll crack on with the equipment choices um, and how we'll we'll do this. We'll kind of we'll kind of break it up into talking about um, uh, regulators, both back mounts, um, regs, and your and stage regs, and then later on we'll we'll move on to things like um, pref preferred choice of wings, plates, harnesses, and then computers. So, so as our as our special guest, Tom, do you want to do you want to get the ball rolling, mate, and, and give us your give us your views on uh, regulators, if you don't mind. So regulators is, I mean, I could talk about equipment for, for days, um, worked on it pretty extensively while I was um, with you guys at Global. Um, so been lucky enough to pull apart pretty much every brand of reg and um, every style as well. So really been able to see the internals and how they work, but also get out in the field and test them as well. So usually what I'm looking for in a regulator um, particularly with the type of diving that I'm doing at the moment, which is in cold water and also in, you know, like caves where we have a lot of sediment and stuff like that. Um, definitely looking for something that's sealed. Um, that also fits in really well with deep technical diving as well, because it effectively turns a regulator into an overbalanced system. Um, so basically it performs even better at depth. 
So something like the um, Apex series um, with the, the dry seal on them, um, they're absolutely amazing. Um, and then also if you're looking at going down the Scoop Pro route as well, something like the Mark 17, um, just found they've been, both those regulators have been absolutely bulletproof and you know they can survive some really tough um, environments but also deliver you the performance that you need as well. Um, with the Apex, I've actually found the hose routing on them tends to be a little bit better because um, with the DSC uh, series, you can get the fifth port on that. So if you're diving twin tanks, for instance, then you can get the crossing over the hoses in the back. Um, yeah. So you can have your low pressure inflator running behind your, your <clears> neck and then also your backup regulator as well. But then with the turret on it, um, that also means that if you're donating the long hose, it, it stops the hose from kinking because it actually allows the, um, the hose to be moved into a position where it's not stressing any of the hoses. And that also directly relates to side mount as well, because then you can use your um, fifth ports for like your dry suit inflators and your, your BC inflator. Um, and then also same thing when you're donating the long hose. So as far as first stages go, um, definitely something that's dry sealed and diaphragm balanced. Um, so yeah, the apex tend to work absolutely phenomenally. And then with second stages, it's, that's a bit of a mixed bag uh, for myself. If I'm doing kind of deep stuff where I need performance, then I would definitely go for something that's balanced. But for kind of more of the nitty gritty cave stuff, I'm actually using unbalanced second stages. And the reason for that is because if the, I do get any crap in the, um, in the second stage, as far as pulling it apart and servicing it in the field, I don't recommend people do this without, you know, prior knowledge as a service technician. Um, but I've had it where you get a little bit of crap on the seat or, you know, the, the seat's bedded in. So with the unbalanced second stages, what we can actually do is if that's the case, then you can actually take the seat out, flip it over, and you've effectively got a new ceiling surface there. So it's actually saved a couple of dives. So yeah, for anything kind of environmentally demanding, I would go for an unbalanced second stage, but if you need the performance for depth, then definitely balance. Cool. All right. Awesome. Thank you. And it's nice, actually, I should have mentioned that at the start, the fact that your background and your experience isn't just from under the water, but the actual service technician part is actually really important as well. And I know, um, certainly from my personal point of view, I've taken a lot of my um, knowledge from Tom when it comes to the, the equipment. And so, um, yeah, so for that, I thank you. And um, yeah, yeah, awesome. All right, uh, next, because Bruce is your first video, we'll go over to your, uh, what's your, your opinions on this, mate? Uh, well, it's, uh, I kind of tend to agree with Tom on the uh, um, sealed first stages. I, I would always go with sealed first stage on the, uh, uh, on, on the cylinder. Uh, it would be a toss-up between, is it the XTX50 dry sealed turret or possibility of the Mark 25 Scuba Pro the, with the Evo with the sealed one as well. All in all, they they are pretty much the same. They do, <coughs> excuse me. They uh, they've got pretty much the same stats. They 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 do differ slightly. Um, they're pretty much the same weight. Um, but for me, I've I've just always been an apex man. It's uh, I've used the dry seal turret now since '94, um, and I've got no reason to change. But saying that though, if you want to go down the scuba pro route, the Mark Twenty Five would be um, um, my choice in that particular brand. Do you know, I don't know if you know this, Tom, but there's there's a new Scoop Pro that's just been launched. Um, it's the Mark 19. So it's actually a, imagine a Mark 17, but in the shape of a Mark 25. So it's absolutely perfect. It's like, it's it's just mint. It's, it's a sealed diaphragm with a swivel turret. So looks like a 25, performs like a 17. I think that actually came out many years ago and then they discontinued it. So they've obviously re-released it now that... Yeah. Um, People yeah. want the fifth thoughts on them. So that's something to be exciting. I think in New Zealand this first season, we were only able to get it with a new um, D400 or 420, one of the, the big Darth Vader. It's a new version. Oh, of yeah. The aliens. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, but, but um, so that, that'll be the alternate, won't it, for us, uh, I guess. So cool. And then for Bruce, for, for second stages, have you got any personal preferences there? Um, any, any of the second stages I would go for, uh, because I'm not into cave diving, anything like that, you're more likely to find me using anything with the old Venturi lever and the uh, resistance adjustment um, knob. So, uh, yeah, again, either the S600 for the Scuba Pro or the, XT, or the XTX50 for, from Apex. Um, from a 
from a stage regulator point of view, it would I would dumb it down and I'd be looking to get some equivalent to the XTX 40 Opti. So it's not less prone to free flow. Right, that is smaller and more calm. Okay, cool. All right, and Dave, anything different? Because <laughs> we might be all leading the same same direction. Yeah. I, I think it is the same. I mean, personally, I've been an Apex, you know, ever since I started technical diving, I've had um, XTX 50s. Um, and yeah, it, it's there yeah, certainly, I mean, I've, I've moved through from twins to side mount and now the rebreather. And those original regulators that I bought about eight years ago, I'm still using and reconfigured so they can be configured for the twins, for the side mount, or to use as a stage regulator um, on your rebreather. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty simple to, to reconfigure them for, for those different sorts of, of use. Okay, cool. So I think we're all in agreement. The only thing I would add um, really just supports the same decision is the fact that of the whole um, Apex range, the service kits are the same. So they just have one first stage service kit, one second stage. So on any, any trip or expedition, I know Tom, Tom and I have been on a few where there's been a lot of divers with a lot of kit, but having just one step, one service kit in your spares can, can potentially help 30 or 40 sets of regs. Um, and so, yeah, I'll that back that same decision up with the, with the Apex. Okay, so that, that was a nice, easy one. Move on to, um, to like choice of different types of wing, um, styles, that kind of thing. So I think, um, I think I'll be right in saying that at least three of the four of us here have, have some experience of different styles. Um, we might see on the, on the screen, there's, there's images of, um, of one or two of us diving in, in certainly bungee mounted wings that are horseshoe. Um, some big old school ones and uh, and then yeah so so there's been a bit of an evolution from from what I can see um, we'll, we'll go to old school Bruce I mean sorry Bruce and, yeah. uh, and then, <laughs> so when we're thinking about twins uh, what, what's your kind of preference for for, for wings um, I me, mean, I, I would always go with a, with a external bungee horseshoe wing um, I, I just like the way they, they fold down. They, uh, they get really small. Um, and people say, oh, you can't use these for singles. So you, you, you can um, because, they, because they scrunch down so, so small. Um, uh, but my preference is the bungee wing, 45 pound or bigger. Cool. My personal one's 94 pound. But <laughs> <laughs> is it dual bladder? <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> it's not. No, I'm afraid it's not. <laughs> I did have one, though, but I, I got rid of that years ago. Yeah. And so, um, Dave, what about yourself? Yeah, I guess, I mean, for me, um, by the time I started tech diving, the um, like 40, 45 pound donut, I think was pretty much the, the standard. Um, and, and that's all I've ever used. So, um, and, and I still do. So um, at the moment, um, I've got a very fetching um, bright yellow OMS 45 pound donut that uh, sort of matches a few other bit of, bits of kit that I've got. But, um, yeah, that 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 is is the one I'm I'm used to. It's it's nice and simple, um, just with the you know the uh, single dump on the left hand side and all that sort of thing. Yeah. All right. So we'll go over to you, Tom. I know from from diving with you for many years, you've got basically gone through the whole route. So I do believe that mm. your experience, you've you have tried them all. And so uh, yeah, do you want to give us your uh, give us your rundown? Yeah. Well, just to put your mind at ease, there, Bruce. My first wing was a dive right ninety five pound dual bladder super <laughs> wing. And uh, yeah, I had that for a number of years before uh, slowly kind of moving on to other things. Um, but yeah, basically it's, a, for me, the wing really depends on what type of cylinders I'm using. So if I'm diving aluminium twins, what I would usually do is I'd go for a 40 pound horseshoe. And the reason for that is because um, with the aluminiums, as the tanks drop in pressure a little bit, the bums of them kind of become a little bit more floaty. Um, so with the horseshoe wing, you don't have that additional little bit of lift down the bottom that's going to try and push your head down. Uh, the only thing with the, the horseshoe is it, it does take a little bit more of a, a technique to actually get the air out the bottom dump because you have to get it up to the top of the wing first before venting it. Um, but I think if I was looking for one kind of decent all-round wing, um, I'd probably go for the, um, the 40 pound single bladder donut style wing. Um, just because it fits pretty much everything. You can use them on rebreathers, you can use them on your twin set open circuit, um, and that doesn't matter if you're diving steels or aluminiums. And yeah, my preference would be unbungeed now. Um, I used to have the bungees for the same reason as Bruce, um, but then 
you know, going towards the, the unbungee now, uh, it's just, it, it's a little less restrictive if, um, if you're trying to orally inflate it. And also the profile in the water is not that huge as it is just because of the way the, the wing actually wraps up around the side of the cylinders. So the, the profile of them doesn't take up that much room. Cool. Awesome. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, and no, I'm going to just support and say the same, basically. I don't need to repeat it. Um, I used to dive double, or sorry, I used to dive a bungee wing and absolutely find it no problem. And then when the, tr the, the kind of trend and the fashion went to donut unbungee, I, I resisted it for a long, long time. So oh, you don't need it. You don't need it. Eventually tried it. I'm like, yeah, it is that It is that little bit better, in, in my opinion, but there's nothing wrong with the other styles. But yeah, the yeah, tool for the job is the right thing. So, yeah. Awesome. It's all about colour now. So I've got a lime green one that I've never oh, used. It's, <laughs> it's still in the box. All right. So so that, if that's wings, so then um, harnesses. What's uh, what's your experiences here? And so again, we'll, we'll um, uh, Dave. will let you start this time. What's your preference for for style of of, of, of harness? Okay. And again, you know, it, it's um, because I've been tech diving as long, I guess I've, I've really only dived the one style, which is the single weave harness with a, with a, you know, solid back plate. Um, for, for tech, I usually prefer when I'm in twins, I usually prefer my, uh, a steel back plate. Um, because basically with a steel back plate and steel cylinders, um, in a lot of configurations that you don't really have to add any more lead, maybe a little bit of a tail weight, which is more about trim than, than, um, than, than actual buoyancy. Cool. Um, yeah, so, so that would be my, um, at the moment, you know, it's the OMS, but I've used a Halcyon one in the past and, and they're all so similar. Um, you don't really know the difference. It's, you know, you really are down to, um, you know, brand features. I guess the only, the only innovation that I really have liked um, in the OMS range um, is the smart, uh, smart stream system, um, which just um, enables you to, to release the, the um, shoulder straps really easily. Um, particularly if you're in a situation where you're having to get out of it in the water and you're wearing bulky sort of undergarments and a dry suit and stuff. Um, it's a lot easier to, to just open up the straps to be able to get out of it and hand it up to the boat. Okay, cool. And Bruce, we'll go around the other way this time. <laughs> okay, for, yeah. um, for, for a tech, tech harness, this, surprises you, this might surprise you, but I would go with the uh, smart stream, with the OMS smart stream, as Dave okay. said, with yeah. stainless steel. So single weave, single weave harness with adjustment. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Yeah. oh, I'm very disappointed. I was expecting you to say you'd like the, uh, the ones with... Come on, Harness 3. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, fair enough. That's all, that's all good. Could, Tom, anything different for you from your experience? No, I've pretty much exclusively dived continuous weave harnesses. I mean, even since day dot, I think the, the initial reason I actually got one was um, because of costs. Um, I was on a bit of a budget when I was, um, when I was 18. Um, but yeah, I've just always used a continuous weave harness, never had an issue with them. There's, I mean, I think the webbing, you, I've changed them out like every now and then. It takes absolutely years to, to cut through any of that webbing. All the hardware just gets transferred. So kind of once you buy one of those systems, it, it will just last you an absolute lifetime. Mm -hmm. And um, there's, for me, my personal preference is actually aluminium. Um, for a couple of reasons and that's mainly for travel because um, you can it, it is obviously a lot lighter for air travel and then you can always add weight to it um, I'm pretty fortunate I don't actually use too much lead as it is so I usually find that with steel back plates I'm a little bit too negative if you are slightly you know uh, of a bigger build then you might find the, uh, the steel would work better for you but for me personally I'll go with a go with an aluminium plate it's, Pretty much all I've ever dived. Cool. Easy. All right. Well, that's a unanimous decision then. And what, what has been really interesting um, is the fact that it's now filtered down. It was already always originally a technical diving choice, and now it's filtered down. So certainly in store, our most popular recreational BC is a single weave harness with a with a quick adjust. You know, the RMS, and we use them in the school. We teach brand new divers. We do discover scubas in them. So. So yeah, it's no longer the, the, the techie side, but uh, all right, fantastic. Um, the, the, the next thing we'll go on to is um, dive computers. This might be a real quick and easy one for us. As <laughs> if anyone who's seen the other two videos, it's good, but we're not expecting huge differences here, but uh, we'll start with you, Tom. Obviously you dive yeah. in some pretty hideous, sort of horrendous um, areas and locations. What, what would your choice of a, of a computer be? 
so there's literally no question. It's uh, it, it's got to be anything sheer water. I mean, at the moment, I'm using the the Perdix AI, um, and that is my go-to computer for absolutely everything. Uh, even when I'm diving on the rebreather, I'll still have that on. Um, but I've actually got one of the old predators for my rebreather, so I can actually plug it in and get my PO2 reading. Um, if personally I had the funds, I would definitely be on a nerd because uh, I, I used yours once in the pool and fell in love with it. It's, it was a very dangerous dive for me. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I think if I was diving a rebreather, the nerd would be what I would mainly be looking for. Um, but as far as a go-to computer that does everything, it does recreational, it does technical, um, you can use it for open circuit, rebreather, it's just absolutely everything. For me, the Perdix AI is just, it's, that's my go-to computer. There's, I, I kind of feel like I would be a little bit too tough on the Terex, um, but again, that's just more from, from the caving side of things. Uh, I know Richard Harris and Craig Challen both have the the Perdix, uh, oh, sorry, not the Perdix, the Terex, and they have been caving with them and cave diving with them, and they seem to be holding up pretty well, but I, I just know myself too well, I'd break it. Yeah, yeah, fair enough, good, good choice. Anything to add or any arguments against that uh, choice, either Bruce or Dave? Um, my personal choice uh, would also be the Perdix AI. Uh, I mean, again, it's sheer water. Um, I would rule, with te for a technical diving sense, I would rule the Terex out just because I personally would find it difficult to operate the buttons with thicker gloves on, um, and how it sits would sit on my dry suit. But my personal favorite would be the Perdex AI. Okay, cool. Dave, you've got a Perdex, have you, or a petrol? But, oh, no, you Perdex. Uh, well, I've got, a, I've got all three. Out, out of all of those, um, actually, when, when I first got the Terex, I thought I would keep using the Perdex a lot more. Um, and I've found an actual fact I haven't. Um, yeah, personally, and, and it, it is a, a bit of a personal thing, but um, I don't find it difficult to operate with gloves. Um, I use it as, as my off-board backup when I'm diving the rebreather and I'm, I'm having to do a lot of gas switches and things, particularly when I'm, I've just been doing a course recently where I've had to do a lot of um, you know, switching to open circuit and things. So using it a lot and, and not finding any trouble doing that. Um, um, I think I've mentioned in other videos also I get another concern I think people have is it's got a small screen compared to the Perdix. But um, my, my reading vision is starting to sort of go off a little bit and, and I don't have any problems reading it. So, um, yeah. Since you made that me, point, I found a video, I found a picture that Pete Mosley took of me when we dived at Atlanta in Solomon's, the trip that you did with us, Tom, and um, on Deco. I said, oh, just get a picture of my new Terex. It's quite new at the time. This is, this is back in 2018. And as you'll see, the, the two computers together, um, we'll zoom in here a little bit, and they, you can see it's actually crystal clear. Um, scary numbers, I think it's like 150 odd minutes total time service, <laughs> we're still at 40 meters. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so, okay, cool. So, so I think- okay, if, Can I throw one, one more point in on the, um, on the computer front? Um, the other reason I've got such a, a huge backing for the guys at Shearwater is because the, their customer service as well, like there's, it's one thing, you know, going out and using equipment in the field and, you know, having stuff that actually works, but you also want to know that you've got the backing there as well. And any issue I've ever had with a shear water, which has usually been my own fault being too rough on equipment, um, they have just gone above and beyond to, you know, look after um, their customers. I mean, there's the, the original shear waters I saw and used were, were actually the shear water pursuits, so the old green screen ones. And I know customers that, that have had one and they had it serviced like only a couple of years ago. And the only reason they're not still diving is because they dropped it off the back of the boat. <laughs> so it just goes to show it's, it doesn't matter how, how old their product becomes, they still back it and they still service it. Or if they can't anymore because they can't get components, then they will usually do whatever they can to, to kind of help you out and, and keep you diving. And there's with the company as well, it's not just that, it's the actual support that they they give the diving community. I mean, they, they put a lot of money into research of medical papers and things like that. And I can only really think of, of two major companies within technical diving that, that are contributing that much to, to our sport, which effectively, uh, a lot of us are still pioneering. I mean, at, at the moment, we're in an age where people are doing more repetitive, deep technical dives, and we got a lot more access to it. And 
you know these these companies are you know they're supporting that and they're, they're helping out with any research and I, I think that is probably another one of the main reasons why i i just love supporting shearwater i mean the 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 computers they just work they do everything you need but also the company is is amazing they're, they're just great people to deal with okay so welcome back we just had a quick uh, quick break and uh, we've just come, come we finished the talking about um computers which was again a, a very very simple decision so what else have we got we've got um we've got the the, the regs the bcd the, the computer so um what about twins tom from from all the different environments you've dived if you were looking for a set of twins say for new zealand what would you your preferences be there so for new zealand i'd probably go for steel um just because first of all you get in the volume there it's also what most other people are diving so as far as um gas matching for your uh, your bailout gas or like your your minimum gas goes then it, it means that you would all be kind of uniformed with that um i would tend to go for uh, steel 12 liter tanks um and with the setup of them you want quality tank bands and also manifold as well um so something like the the hesse tank bands are just amazing it's you know german engineering and they, they just fit like an absolute glob i think the first time i personally bought those into the country it took us about seven or eight emails to actually make sure we had the correct tank band that they made for our cylinders because of course everything's a different spec and you know sometimes they can be a mil or two millimeters different and uh, the guys over at has so like again same amazing company ethics so they just went above and beyond to make sure we had exactly what we needed for manufacturers of the tanks i'd probably go with faber um they've just got you know the, the track record uh, amazing cylinders they don't tend to rust inside if they do you can still rumble them and they come out uh, nicely um and also the characteristics of the cylinders as well um for instance the the length to weight ratio just just works really nicely with the manifolds though i would say you again high quality ones uh, something which has rubber hand wheels um we used to use you know like the old school plastic ones but i found in overhead environments like in caves and wrecks and stuff you can actually shatter them uh, which then renders the the valve handle completely useless awesome all right yeah there's probably not much else to add there is there guys what you've described um, is pretty much what we what we sell uh, bruce anything from your uh, experience anything from the 90s that you'd argue is different um no not really uh although i would say that you have people out there that um will feel that they can't handle twin 12s so but there's nothing wrong with stepping it down to twin 10s or if we could get them twin 7s um but yeah, so uh, like twin tens, nothing wrong with using twin tens. We can still band them up as well. Yeah, same manifold, same same. Uh, yeah, we, same we can band up twin eighteens. Yeah, <laughs> 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 we have had a couple of guys with twin fifteens, and they were always a nightmare. We used to make them carry them to the filling station and carry them back. But uh, well, do you remember my twin eighteens? Oh, that's right. Yeah, the yeah. white ones. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they were huge. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why rebreathers were invented. So. Right. You almost touching the ground, wouldn't they, Tom? With the at the um, they, they were actually uh, they were a dream to dive. They were super stable in the water. The biggest issue was climbing back up a ladder on the boat. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm pretty sure I am. Um, like on one trip, I was climbing back up the ladder, and I thought I bent myself, but it turned out I just pulled a muscle in my arm. <laughs> just climbing up the ladder. So yeah, I, I definitely wouldn't recommend twin eighteens. Okay, so now we're going to go on to primary lights. So around the room, we've got quite a bit of experience of wreck divers, cave divers, um, and we're, we're going to see whether there is any particular style of lights that will work for everything, or do we need specific um, tools for the job? Um, so yeah, if I can, if I can come straight over to you, Tom. Uh, obviously, with the quite extreme diving that you do, um, can you can you give us your um, your input on this? Yeah. So if I was diving a uh, twin tank um open circuit usually what i used to use was like one of the old big canister lights so i think the the first one i ever owned was a it was a lead acid battery with like a 10 watt hid head on it and since then things have evolved tenfold and it's it's meant that you know lights have got smaller burn times have got longer 
and the lights are also brighter as well. Um, so currently what I'm actually using is one of the um, Light Monkey handheld lights and it's it's tiny. It's you know, is it literally sits on the back of your hand in a with a Goodman handle and um it does absolutely everything it needs to do. Like if I'm cave diving on twin tanks, then it usually gives me about four and a half hours of burn time. I think because I got the old nine watt version, not the new twelve watt. Um so I get about four and a half hours out of it, which is enough for, you know, any diet um, that you're really gonna do. Um and it's it works with twins if you're side mounting as well. Um, you can use it for that if you want a rebreather. It, it goes on absolutely everything, and you don't have the the cable leading back to a giant canister. Um, so it's also travel friendly as well, and it, it, it's just been an absolute dream to use. It for sure, it's not the brightest thing out there, but I've usually found that the only time I would need something that is you know crazy bright is when you're in that beautiful cobalt blue water where you're trying to see as far as possible you're in big chambers or you know open water or something like that whereas for a lot of the um the actual slightly murkier siltier diving that we do like either in a wreck or a cave or you know sometimes the ocean can just have a lot of particulate in it and um, something that is actually not quite so bright i've actually found has been a little bit more beneficial yeah. because you don't get quite so much backscatter coming back um, with those handheld light monkey lights as well the opportunity so the, the version i've got is the the twist on twist off version so the the older style and what that means is if you're doing multiple dives as well you can change your um, change your battery cell yeah um that unfortunately doesn't work at depth so if you are doing deeper diving i would probably recommend the other style in that light where it's got the magnetic switch on the back um just because then you can turn it on and off at depth but usually for my kind of diving i'm turning it on at the start of the dive and i'm turning it off at the end of the dive so i don't really have to you know manipulate it underwater um one of the main things i like in a primary light is one of the hard goodman handles so like the old school aluminium ones as opposed to like one of the soft kind of gloves that sits on the back of your hand um just because it's it's a bit more stable um, but also I have a, a cutting device, which is actually on the underside of the, um, the light. And that's actually pretty much my primary cutting device. So, so as far as cutting devices go, I know this is a little bit off topic, but I have one on the bottom of the, the Goodman handle, and then I have another one on my wrist computer over there. Um, and they're both very easy to get to. Um, but I find the one on the bottom of the Goodman handle, it's a tiny blade, it's only about that big. But you're normally only cutting dive line or monofilament or something like that. So it's, it's all you really need. And to have that on your light is very helpful. Um, but the other thing I also have on the primary light is, if I'm cave diving, is um, line markers. Yeah. So there's a piece of bungee that goes over the top of the light. And you can actually put your line markers on there. So you're not faffing around in pockets or anything trying to pull them off. Yeah. Um, but they're still stable and somewhere where you can see them so you're not going to drop them and that bungee actually also doubles up as a different mounting point so you can either clip it from the, the bottom of the bolt snap so it points down so for instance if you're doing deco or something and you're hovering you know opposite someone else and you don't want to blind them clip it off from the tail and then it points directly down or if you're in a cave where you need to be hands free for a little bit then you clip through that that bungee on the top off to your d-ring and it actually points forwards so as you're swimming out the cave you can be completely hands free and you can still see where you're going mm. so yeah i think primary lights the uh, for me light monkey have you know come out with some amazing stuff and personally i like the uh, the little handheld ones as opposed to the big canisters now although if you're diving back mount open circuit then the big canisters are absolutely fine because you can mount them very easily and even the canisters seem to have got smaller because, as you say, the battery oh. technology has improved. You no longer need those massive 30 amp hour, the, the 10 and the 15s are more than enough. So, um, we, we tend to sell more of the 10 amp battery pack, which is their smallest one, yeah. with, with any, any size um, light head um, for, that, for that main reason. So, yeah, good, good point. So, I think, again, from what you experienced, I mean, we've probably sold a hundred of those handies off your experience, Tom, because uh, in the shop, people are looking at the, the big ones. So, well, Tom Crisp used this and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And so, yeah, I think, yeah, they've been Yeah, really that one's still going strong. Yeah, the handy, the handy from Light. Handy. What about? <laughs> <laughs>
All right. So, uh, we'll go. Bruce, uh, anything to, to add, argue, disagree with? Um, no, uh, Tom's fairly covered it fairly succinctly. Uh, I mean, personally, I use Canlight. Uh, yeah. Mine is a green force uh, with the 100 watt HID, which is, <laughs> is donkey's years old. Uh, uh, yeah. However, um, what I have found is I am more often than not using my camera lights, which is Solar 2000s, with, uh, with, with the older Solar 2000s. Yeah. And the the, uh, the main torch is there just for a backup now yeah. because I, you know, I'm using it for video. So if I was to buy a new one, I would probably uh, look at one of the Light Monkey cam lights as well. Okay, cool. And, and um, Dave, you've got one of the handies as well, haven't you? I know you've yeah. Got, and, uh, so you I've know, got the handy well. and I've also got the, um, can, the 3210 um, can light. Yeah. Um, I, I got the handy more recently and, and yeah, again, I've put the hard Goodman handle on it um, because of the stability um, as uh, for the reasons Tom talked about. Um, the, and yeah, I'm, I'm finding I'm using that in preference to the can light now. Um, although the can light is very good and, and the 3210, the fact you can use the piezo to dial down the intensity um, so the brightness can be adjusted um, and, and that makes it a really, really long run time um, if you dial it because you don't need it on full noise. Um, but just the lack of bulk and convenience, the handy is, is probably the one I'm using more. Yeah, yeah same. So we've got both and uh, use it more. So, so yeah, we'll, we'll conclude with that. We'll say that the, the staff choice there is, um, is the Light Monkey Handy, the, the 12 watt. So uh, fantastic. Okay, so, so we've covered most of the hardware there. The next one is the, the stage cylinder or the decompression cylinder. Um, the, uh, the, the preferred choice there, we'll start with you, Bruce. What, what would your recommendation there be? Uh, my recommendation that I would go for the uh, Luxfer 80 um, cubic foot cylinder, um, mainly because it, it's, it's nicely balanced. Uh, and when it gets empty, it does start to take the weight. Uh, it becomes slight buoyant, so there's no major um, difference in, in your buoyancy characteristics as long as you're aware of it's happening. But yeah, it's very comfortable to wear. It's just easy as. Cool. Everyone agree with that? I think, um, Tom, yep. it's your choice. Yeah, definitely. Um, the the Luxors seem to have the, the slightly nicer buoyancy characteristics for um, stage tanks. Uh, the one way I would say I'd personally rig absolutely every single stage tank. It doesn't matter if I'm rebreather diving side mount diving or open circuit technical diving it, for me it's always the same and that's basically the um the original kind of GUE DIR method with the um you know like the the paracord um that's got a bit of old fuel hose around it and then um, just a jubilee clip hanging it together um because i found it's if you're side mount diving um i've normally got my stuff butt clipped so you can clip the, the top one up like a normal stage tank. And then if you actually reach down in between your side mount tank and then pull the tail up and clip it to your butt, then it holds everything nice and tight. And um, if you're open circuit diving as well um, on twins, then, I mean, we've all seen how that works. Um, you can clip one on the inside um, with a little tail wrapped around itself and then another one on the outside with a slightly longer tail as well. So it just, just really works for that. And it's the same with rebreathers. Um, Valves as well, I'd probably stick with the 200 bar DIN um, with the same kind of quality characteristics you'd be looking at in a manifold. Yeah. And label them properly. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Tom. Okay, so is there, is there any, other, any other technical equipment that you'd say is a, is a must-have or something that's changed your diving or made a real positive um, in, impact on, on your diving for any of the guys? Um, I would say if you're wreck deep wreck diving, they were saying like sub 40, 40 meters, then you need a strobe for the line. But the best one on the market at the minute by far is the, uh, is the Light Monkey BAF. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. There's, there's actually, for anyone who wants one, there's three of them on the Niagara at the moment. So um, the <laughs> if you can get mine back, it's got my name on it. <laughs> cool, all right, so a, a, a BAF uh, for you, Bruce, fantastic. And uh, Tom, what about yourself? Um, so probably SMBs and spools, really. There's um, so I know I, I originally used to dive with like the old school rec reels, you know, the ones with like the metal handle yeah. and like the plastic unwinds. Um, and then over the years, just kind of dumbed it down to just the absolute basic finger spool. Um, but even with those, there's there's little features that you kind of still need to look out for. Um, the probably the main one I found is actually using the the Delrin spools. Um, they've just lasted 
forever. I've never snapped one of the little um, the little holes where you, you put the bolt snap through. Yeah. And they just keep going and going and going. And then also the quality of line that's on it as well. Mm. Um, yeah, and SMBs used to always use the old school, um, you know, the open-ended ones, the, yeah. what they were called, semi-closed. Um, but I've more recently switched over to the, the ones with the little laurel inflate on them. Um, I've just found that they've been an absolute dream to dive. And I guess if, if you're struggling to orally inflate them as well, you can always attach a BC hose and send yeah. it up that way. But they, they've just come on leaps and bounds and yeah, really nice to use. All right. Thanks, Tom. And Dave, what about yourself? One bit of kit that you think is a, an essential? Um, one that's probably you know quite a common one, but um, when I first started tech diving, I, I was using a wrist slate. And then switching to wet note, you know, having a good set of wet notes, um, it really is a bit of a, an all-purpose tool because not only can you use it for writing and, and if you are, you know, writing up a, a schedule, you know, you can have that on there and slip it actually on like a wrist slate if you want to with the elastic. But then it also has a couple of pockets and things. I always keep things like my Pandora tool, a um, couple of uh, cable ties um, in the wet notes and you've got some stuff there you can actually execute underwater repairs. Um, so it's a toolkit and a communication device all in one. Yeah, I actually keep um, a couple of port plugs and O-rings in mine, and uh, you just completely forget about them, and they've actually saved my dive. Oh, and a little high-pressure spool for the, the gauges, mm. and it saved so many dives just having, you know, the wet notes with, you know, some pretty basic tools in there just means yeah. you can actually save a dive. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so for me, for, for, for my... One bit of technical kit, which I, I think has kind of um, made such an influence on my tech diving, is just thermal protection. Um, but obviously, going from from one hour long recreational dives to then doing pushing much bigger two, three, four hour dives, um, I think I can just thank Fourth Element for the for the, the developments they've done. And so over the years, that when they brought out the Halo, that was kind of a, a, a game changer. Um, the at the moment, the X Core is just absolutely blowing me away and it's just super comfortable super flexible so um so yeah i think that certainly um in my opinion being able to stay comfortable after a long dive and long decompression is is is, is massive so um another company that's got huge ethics that they, they they really care about the, the people so it, it's um it's almost like a, it's almost a it goes without saying doesn't it in technical diving doesn't matter what brand of dry suit you've got most people have got four helmet on garments so, yeah yeah um, can I just weigh in on that as well? Yeah. Um, there's, I mean, particularly with a lot of the diving we've been doing recently, I mean, literally the last dive I did was uh, a couple of weeks ago over in Canada and um, water temperature was three degrees and we were extremely remote. So we made the decision to actually not use heated undergarments because we wouldn't really have any way of charging them. And also it would mean that we, we had to lug big battery packs in as well. Um, so Andrew, you, you were actually kind enough to, to lend me your X core. And uh, at first I was a little bit skeptical when people were saying this is gonna replace your heated vest. And then after doing you know, an hour dive in three degrees, and not even noticing a chill, not getting one shiver. It, it, it completely blew me away. It was, I, I actually never used anything like that. So mm. it's, it's a no-brainer. I'm gonna to have to definitely get some of those. <laughs> They're brilliant. Um, but the other thing is as well, um, with Fourth Element, I mean, like you said, the company ethics are just outstanding. I mean, you see what they're doing with the Ocean Positive um, line of stuff it's they're putting back and giving back to the industry as well which is great and um they, they were actually kind enough to to give me some j2 undergarments for uh, for this trip and it's actually it, a lot of their product is actually very multi-sport as well i mean i've been using those j2s for ski touring yeah um and they're they're just they're made well they work well they do exactly what they're supposed to and yeah i, I just wouldn't use any other undergarments mm. Brilliant. Thank you. Awesome. All right. So again, I'd like to really thank uh, Tom. But whereabouts are you at the moment, Tom? I should really ask you at the start. Where, where are you coming? I'm from? back in Monica. I uh, finally managed to get back down here. <laughs> yeah, had uh, pretty much three weeks in quarantine after getting back from Canada. So um, if anyone doesn't really know the story, there's uh, we'll have some uh, video and stuff that will be coming out soon. But basically, we uh, went into that cave system 
um, not knowing anything and uh, the, the world was normal. We spent two weeks in there camping in negative 25 and uh, yeah, merged to Ghost Town in one of Canada's probably most tourist operated towns and it was one of the spookiest things I think I've witnessed and everyone turned their phones on they just went absolutely nuts saying oh look you guys need to get home and come back so <laughs> yeah made the flight back and just spent pretty much three weeks in quarantine up in Auckland and then finally managed to get home here so kind of I'm very glad to be back in New Zealand and very glad to be actually back home after two months away basically yeah fantastic well, thanks for making the effort coming all the way from Canada just for this uh, meeting time. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, thanks, Dave and Bruce. Hopefully, by the time people are watching this, it's a l life is back to a little bit more normality. But the, the actual content is 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 current and it's active, and it's probably the same advice we've been given for a few years. So uh, yeah, so thanks for thanks for watching. Thanks everyone for the contribution, and we'll uh, we'll see you next time. We've got to choose a subject for the next uh, one now, so we'll have a chat about that off, off, off there, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you.